What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to go through the Algebra 1 January 2023 multiple choice questions. I'll leave a link to a copy of the test in the description below. So for the first question, we want to know when this expression is written in simplest form, the result is one of these. So what we could do here is just distribute. So we're going to have 2x times x is 2x squared. And then we're going to distribute here. We have 2x times negative 4 is going to give us negative 8x. And then next, we're going to distribute the negative 3. But just be careful. When you distribute the negative 3, remember to multiply both terms by negative 3. So we're going to have minus 3x. And then when we distribute the negative 3 to the positive 5, we're going to have minus 15. So now our final answer, we're going to have 2x squared. And then minus 8x minus 3x is going to give us minus 11x. Because we're just going to add those coefficients. Negative 8 plus negative 3 is negative 11. And then we just tack on the negative 15. And we go looking here, and this is going to match up with choice 1. Now, if you're scared of the algebra, you could go to the y equals, and you could type in the question and all the answers. Now, I'll just write in the choices here for 1 and 2, but if we look at the table by pressing second graph, you could see here that when we look at y1, which was the question, and then y2 was answer choice 1, notice that all the y values match, but then if you look at answer choice 2 in this column here, Notice the y values here do not match the corresponding y values in the first column. So that's if you're nervous about doing the algebra. That's just a nice little calculator trick that will also get you the right answer. So for question two, we have the point 3w is on the graph of y equals 2x plus 7. We want to know the value of w. But notice w is in the y spot. So that means we're going to replace x with 3, and we're going to replace y with w. So we'd have w equals 2 times x is equal to 3 plus 7. And now when we work this out, this is going to give us 6 plus 7 which is going to give us 13. So choice four is looking good. For the third question here, we have to know the definition of standard form. Students were asked to write this polynomial in standard form, which means we start with the highest power of x, and then we write the powers of x in descending power order. So right away, looking at Alexa's response, Alexa is not correct here because she's starting with 4x to the second, and 2x to the third is showing up in this place here. That would have to be first. So this choice is out. And then we look here, 2x to the third is definitely the highest power of x, but notice x to the first is a smaller power than x to the second. So that's why Carol is wrong. Now it looks like Ryan here is the one that's correct because it goes x to the third, x to the second, x to the first, and then the constant term. And now Eric is not correct because x to the third is showing up second instead of first. So Ryan, choice three is our solution. For question four, you could do this in the calculator, but my advice is be very, very, very careful what you do because the most common mistake I see is students go like this. They go negative three times, and when they plug in negative two, they do negative two squared without parentheses, and then they tack on their plus 10, and I can guarantee the wrong answer is going to be waiting for us, and they go with choice three, which is actually incorrect. All right, this is a very dangerous trap, so what you would do instead just to avoid that trap is you go to the y equals here and go to the y one spot, and you could write negative 3x squared and then plus 10 like this. And we press second graph and we look to negative 2. The function value is actually negative 2. So this one is going to be choice 2. But if we were to do this by hand, f of negative 2 is equal to negative 3. Make sure you write your negative number in parentheses when you substitute before you square it. Because this means negative 2 squared is 4. So we would have negative 3 times positive 4 plus 10, and then negative 3 times 4 is going to give us negative 12 plus 10, and that's going to give us negative 2, which is the correct answer. So for question 5, we want to know which relation is a function, and two things come to mind. To use the vertical line test, which I'll abbreviate, and also to look for repeating x values. Okay, so repeating x values is bad because a function or a relation that has repeating x values is not a function. So looking at this, see we have x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3, x equals 4. So right away, choice 1 is looking good because none of the x values repeat. But of course, I would look at the other answer choices and see why those are no good. But notice here, we have an input value of 7 showing up twice. And if we have an input value of 7 showing up twice, that means we have repeating x values with different y values. So this would not be a function. You could also visualize it like this. If I go out to 7, and then I go up to, let's say, 3, and I go up to 5, this wouldn't be a function because if I draw a vertical line, notice it's going to hit these two points that have the same x-coordinate but different y-coordinates. So 2 is definitely out. A circle is not a function of x. Not my best artwork because when I... Well, when we draw this vertical line here, notice it hits the circle twice. Some students say, wait a minute, if I draw a vertical line out here, it doesn't hit the circle, but you have to be able to 
draw a vertical line anywhere without hitting the graph twice. Something like, let's say, y equals x squared. Not my best artwork, but if I draw a vertical line at any location of this parabola, notice it's only going to hit the parabola once. So that's why we could say something like f of x equals x squared is a function. But this one here, not, because we hit the graph twice. Now this one here, notice 6 is going to two different places. So this is the repeating x value. It's like we have the point 0.65 and we also have the point 0.67. So repeating x values is no good. Definitely choice 1. Question 6, you got to show up knowing your vocabulary. So with a box and whisker plot here like this, this is just a general drawing here. Notice this is your min value. This is your maximum value. This point of the box and whisker plot is Q1. This is the median, which I'll abbreviate. And this point here is Q3. So when I'm looking for Q3, that's going to be this portion of the box and whisker plot. And that's going to line up here. And it looks like we're counting by twos. Because over here, we would have 34. Then we would have 36. And then counting by twos would bring us exactly to 38. So we're looking here at this location. The value we care about here for the third quartile is going to be 36 choice 3. So for the seventh question here, I'm going to show a calculator trick. And this trick is so good, it should be illegal. But we would use math up and then go to numeric solver here. And what you do is you type the left side of the equation over here. So we have 2 plus 3 times 2, and I'll use x instead of a, plus 1. And then we go down to equation 2, uh, or e2, which is the right side. And we've got 3 times x plus 2. And now for this next part, this part's a little bit funky to get used to, but there, x equals is kind of like a guess. And I would say, how about x equals 0? Because we have some positive and some negative answers. So I say our answer is near 0. But notice all of the answers they gave us are between negative 1 and positive 1. These are fractions where the absolute value of the fraction is between 0 and 1. So all of the answer choices fall between these two numbers. So that's what they mean by bound. So now I'm going to press the up arrow. And to press solve, don't press enter. Press the graph button. And right away, I can see 0.33333 is our answer, which is 1 third. So that would give us choice 2. But of course, it would be a form of neglect if all I do is show you a calculator trick. So now let's do this the technical way. So what I would do here is distribute. I would have distribute the 3, and we're going to have 2 plus 3 times 2a is going to give us 6a, plus 3 times 1 is going to give us 3, equals, we have 3 times a is 3a, plus 3 times 2 is going to give us 6. And we are going to subtract 3a on both sides. This is not the ne necessarily the particular order we have to do things, but this is just one order we could do things. We generally want to get the variable to one side of the equation. So this is going to cross out. And now we're going to have 2 plus 3a plus 3 equals just 6 is left. And now combine like terms. We have 2 plus 3. So we're going to have 3a plus 5 is equal to 6. And now subtract 5 on both sides. All right, just know we could have combined like terms all at once there, but the order in which you do some of these steps here is not really that important. So we have 3a equals 6 minus 5 is 1. And I'll just write that over here. 3a equals 1. Divide both sides by 3. And you're going to get a equals 1 over 3. So choice 2 is definitely it. Just know that this calculator trick, the equation solver, only works when there's exactly one solution. So you have to be a little bit careful using this for quadratic equations. It's not going to transfer as nicely to those. But these linear equations, when your variable is just to the first power, for all the terms, you could definitely use this trick. Question eight, we have a whole lot to read. It's Saturday afternoon, there are three friends, and they're keeping track of their text messages they received from 8 a.m. to noon. And here are the results. Emily said the number of messages she receives increases by eight each hour. So that means she's starting at, let's say, zero, then eight, then 16, then 24. So these are just the multiples of eight. And if we were to write a function for this, something like y equals 8x, would capture this. This would be 8 times 1, 8 times 2, 8 times 3. And this is definitely a linear function because we're going up by the same amount each time. Now, Jessica's messages are doubling. And this is looking exponential already before I even list anything. But that would be, let's say she has 2 for 1 hour, then 4, then 8. It just keeps multiplying by 2. So this would be an exponential pattern, something along the lines of y equals 2 to the x. And then Chris gets three messages the first hour, then 10, then none, then 15. So this one, there is not, this is a nonlinear, non-exponential, okay? So there's like uh, just some random assortment of text messages for Chris. So Chris is like just kind of out of the mix. But they want to know which of these friends, their messages uh, they receive each hour can be described as a linear function. That would be Emily.
Emily is the one getting a linear pattern of text messages. Question nine, we need to know this law of exponents. When we have a to the b times a to the c, we keep the bases the same and then we add the exponents together. So notice these two have the same base, so we would have x plus four to the two plus three, which would give us x plus four to the fifth power. So that's gonna give us choice two. Now, why isn't it choice one? Well, choice one would be the answer if it was x to the x plus four to the second, and then in parentheses, parentheses raised to the third power like this, because this law of exponents, a to the b to the c, gives us a to the b times c. So then choice one would be correct, but not in this case. And then for this one, a student like this will accidentally multiply x times x and get x squared, and four times four to get 16. But even so, if you were to multiply x plus four times x plus four without exponents or with exponents of one on each of those, you're gonna actually have to distribute and you're gonna have four terms. You're not just gonna have two terms like this. So those are just, yeah, wrong all around. Choice two is definitely our answer. So question 10, if you know your rules for transformations, you can just think about this. So when I hear ax squared and a is a positive integer, right away the graph that I'm seeing in my head is a parabola that smiles at us. So a parabola like this. But then if I were to multiply, or in this case, Caitlin multiplies a by negative two, then negative two a x squared, that's gonna flip this upside down and it's gonna make it more narrow. So if you just know your rules, then you're gonna see it's choice one. Otherwise, what you could do here is you could go to the y equals and you could pick a to be any positive integer. Let's say a equals one. So we'd have one x squared. And now if we were to multiply one x squared by negative two, the next graph would be negative two x squared. So if you're unsure, you could just pick out a random value for a that is a positive integer. And now when you graph both of them, press zoom six, that will fix any graph if your graph is out of whack. So notice f of x equals one x squared and then negative two x squared. See that the new graph is upside down and it's definitely narrower than the blue graph here. So choice one is looking good. So for question 11, you wanna know this formula. The amount equals the principal value, which is the initial amount, times one plus or minus the rate to the power t. So for this question, this is a good formula to know. So Sonny is purchasing a new car for this much money. So that's gonna be the value for p. So right away we have a equals 29,873 times, and we're gonna have either one plus or minus. But notice the car depreciates, which means it goes down in value. So since the car is going down in value, we're gonna subtract the rate that they give us, and the rate they give us is 20%, but be careful. The rate is 20%, but as a decimal, that's, well, first we'll write it as a fraction. 20% means 20 out of 100. And then this will simplify to 0 0.20 like this. So we could see here that we're gonna have one minus 0 0.20. And if you don't know how to do this, you could always just do 20 divided by 100 in a calculator, and it's gonna give you this decimal here. And now we're raising this to the power t. So when you look at the answer choices here, you could see that this is gonna match up with choice three right away. Four is no good because that would be if the car is going up 20% in value, which doesn't happen. If you buy a new car, it's immediately going down in price as soon as you leave. This one, uh, choices one and two are incorrect because there is no one minus attached. This would just be if you just keep taking 20% of this value here. So this one here, um, is no good. And for this one, they actually don't convert 20% correctly to a decimal. They just write it as 20. So that's very wrong. Choice three is our answer. Question 12, we can solve algebraically, but if you have a calculator, it's much easier to just graph both of them. So we have x squared plus 2x plus 1, and then we're going to go and graph g of x, which is 7x minus 5. And I know that the answers are going to be reasonable. For which values of x is f of x equal to g of x. So we wanna see when do the graphs intersect. So I'm gonna press zoom six to make sure that we're graphing this in standard form. And looking at this here, it might be a little bit difficult to see the points of intersection. So then maybe here I would refer to the table and press second graph. And then notice, like let's say I use negative one. See at negative one here, the y one is zero and y two is negative 12, they don't match. So I know choice one is no good here. And also choice two because negative one is not an answer. Now I would look at, let's say, negative three. And at negative three, we have a y value of four and a y two value of negative 26. So right away, that one is also not looking good. 
So now I go to the last two answer choice, or the last answer choice with the last two roots, x equals 2, x equals 3. And notice we have matching y values. x equals 2 gives us a y value of 9 for f of x and g of x. And then when we have x equals 3, f of x is equal to 16 and g of x will go up to 16. And if I want to be able to see this, notice this goes off the graph. I would go here to the window. So I'll go to the window setting. And because 16 is way too high, right now we're stopping at 10. I would go up to a maximum of 20. That way I could see what's going on. And since the roots are 2 and 3, I don't need to go all the way to negative 10. I could start at 0 and I can make my x maximum stop at 5. So now when I press graph, I get a much better picture. And here you could actually see the two points of intersection which represent our answers, the moments where f of x and g of x are equal. So x equals 2 and x equals 3 are our solutions. Choice 4. Question 13, we have Schuyler mowing lawns. f of x is used to model the amount of money earned. x is the number of lawns completely mowed. So a reasonable domain, remember domain, just make sure you know your vocab for this uh, for the regions, is the x values. And the range is the y values. But if you think about this here, they told us x is the number of lawns. So this is the number of lawns completely mowed. So real numbers wouldn't work because let's say, all right, I completely mowed 2.31765 lawns. That doesn't make sense. Rational numbers doesn't make sense because I could say, all right, I mowed this many lawns. Like that also is not going to divide evenly and we need the number of lawns completely mowed. So that's out. Irrational numbers like I mowed pi lawns doesn't make sense. Completely mowed. Natural numbers definitely make sense because the natural numbers start at 1 and they go to 2, 3, 4, and so on. This makes sense for our domain because we would completely mow a whole number of lawns. We're not going to mow part of a lawn because then it wouldn't be completely mowed. So for this one here, we can type the question and all the answers in the graph and see which ones match. But let's just do the algebra here. So we're going to factor out a greatest common factor of 2 since all of those numbers are even. And now if you divide everything by 2, you're going to have x squared. And then 8x over 2 is going to give us 4x. And then minus 10 over 2 is going to give us minus 5. So now to factor this, I need two numbers that have a sum of 4 and that have a product of negative 5. So for this, it really helps if you're able to multiply and add numbers very quickly in your head. So the mystery numbers here, well, one of them is going to be positive and one of them is going to be negative since they're multiplying to a negative. And then the product that would build 5 would be 5 and 1, but the bigger number is going to be the positive one. And we have x minus 1 here because 5 minus 1 is going to give us 4. And then 5 times negative 1 would give us negative 5. So now we just got to scan the answer choices here. And this is going to match up with choice 1. So question 15, we have Ian throwing a ball up in the air. And he lets it fall to the ground. And then the height of the ball, h of t, is modeled by this equation. And we want to know what the number 3 represents. So if you just know the basic concepts here, that the constant at the end is the y-intercept, then you might be able to just do this without a calculator. But since you are allowed a calculator for the test, there's no shame in writing this out. So we have negative 16. Instead of t squared, we're going to write x squared. And then we have plus 6 times x, and then plus 3. But just think about it. The only appropriate domain, if I press zoom 6, I'm going to get somewhat of a picture here. But the only appropriate domain here would be to start when x is positive because this is the moment that Ian throws the ball is at time zero. So now if I graph it, see I get a slightly better picture here, but then it looks like this graph is gonna stop at x equals one. So then I could even just go here to an x maximum of one. And then if I press graph again, notice here that this captures everything that we need. But now let's think about this. If we go to second graph, we look at the table. So what does the value three represent? This represents the height of the ball at time t equals 0. So if I transfer what we saw in the picture here, at time t equals 0, we're starting at a height of 3. The ball is thrown, and then it hits the ground like this. So now we go scanning the answer choices. The number 3 represents the maximum height of the ball. That's not going to be true, because the maximum height of the ball would be somewhere over here, not at the beginning. The height from which the ball is thrown is sounding good, because this is going to be Ian over here. So here's Ian. Okay, so Ian is standing here like this okay and he is throwing the ball 
and the ball goes here, here, and drops down like this. All right, so there's Ian. That's the height from which Ian is throwing the ball. And now the number of seconds it takes the ball to reach the ground, that's not the answer. To find that, we would actually have to find the x-intercept or the root of this quadratic equation and see how much distance is it from zero to this location. That would be the time it takes to hit the ground. And then the number of seconds it takes for the ball to reach its maximum height, that would be if we found the vertex, which we didn't find the vertex. Choice two is definitely our answer. So take a second to read through 16. Ultimately, what we want to find is which function type best models the relationship between the numbers of rounds completed and the number of teams remaining. So if we look here, what jumps out at me is that the X's are all going up by one. Okay, so the X's are changing at a constant rate here, but notice the Y values are not decreasing by the same number each time. We're going down 16, down eight, down four, down two. What is happening though, that we're dividing by two each time. So if you're dividing or multiplying by the same number each time, to get from one Y value to the next. That means your pattern is exponential. And if I actually had to write an exponential function for this, this would be 32 times one half to the X power. And if you were to punch this in the Y equals, you would see this exact table show up. So exponential is definitely our answer. Now for question 17, we have a geometric sequence and we have the first term is four and the common ratio is negative three. We wanna know what is the fifth term. So for this one, when you have a geometric sequence, you're gonna multiply by the common ratio to get from one thing to the next. So we're gonna do four times negative three, and that's gonna give us negative 12. And then if we multiply by negative three again, that's gonna give us positive 36. And if we do times negative three again, that's gonna give us negative 108. And then one more time is gonna switch us back to positive, and we're gonna have 324. So choice one is definitely our answer. Take a second to read through 18. So we have this formula here, and what we want to find is we want to come up with an equation to find its final temperature T sub F. So basically we're taking this equation, Q equals MC times T sub F minus T sub I, and our goal is to solve for final temperature, which is this piece here that I'm highlighting in pink. So with this type of algebra, you can distribute the MC, but I think it's easier here to just divide both sides by MC. And the reason why we're allowed to do this is because this is MC times this binomial. So if we divide by MC, these factors are gonna just cancel out. And now what we're gonna have is, we're gonna have Q over MC equals, and all we're left with is TF minus TI. So to solve for TF, just add TI to both sides. And this is gonna give us our equation for TF. We're gonna have T sub F equals, and I know I wrote it a little bit out of order, but now I'm gonna move the right side to the left. We have TF equals Q over MC plus TI. So now we just scan the answer choice here, and this is looking like choice two. Question 11, we have this equation here, and we just wanna get it started by completing the square. Now, when you are completing the square, when you have something like AX squared plus BX plus C is equal to zero, you wanna target the B term. And you wanna take the B term, cut it in half, and then square it. So B divided by two squared. So just keep that in mind, because for this question, we have X squared minus 12X, and then we have minus 10 equals zero. And for these questions, I recommend moving the constant to the other side when you have an equation. And you'll have X squared minus 12X, and I'm gonna leave a space here, because there's these are gonna cancel out, equals zero plus 10. And then to find that mystery number to add to both sides, we're gonna take half of the B term and square it, and our B term is equal to negative 12. So if I take negative 12, I divide it by two, and then I square it, that's gonna give me negative six squared, and negative six times negative six is 36. So that's the mystery number to add to both sides like this. But now when I look at this, it's called completing the square because you're turning this quadratic into a perfect square trinomial. When we look for two numbers that have a sum of negative 12 and a product of 36, those two numbers are gonna be, we're gonna have x minus six times x minus six because negative six plus negative six is negative 12. And then negative six times negative six is gonna give us positive 36. And now the right side is 10 plus 36, which is 46. But now I could rewrite the left side as x minus six squared since I'm multiplying it by itself. And now I just scan the answer choices here and this is gonna match choice four. Now question 20, we wanna know which quadratic function has the smallest minimum value. And just know the minimum value occurs at the vertex. So this occurs at the vertex. So we just have to be able to find the vertex in all these different forms here. 
So now looking at this one, you can see here that the vertex is at the point zero, zero. So here for choice four, the min value is gonna be y equals zero. And the minimum function value is always referring to the minimum y value. So the lowest y value is gonna be at zero. So that's our minimum here. But then if I look at this choice three, we have to know the vertex form of a quadratic equation where we have a times x minus h squared plus k and the vertex is gonna be at the point h comma k. So for choice three, the vertex is actually gonna be, notice how it's x minus h. So our x value is gonna be two and then our k value or the y value of our vertex is negative two. So remember the minimum value occurs at the vertex, of course, provided that your parabola your quadratic equation is smiling at you. It's a positive x squared. It'll make a minimum because if it was a negative x squared parabola, then the vertex would represent the maximum. So here the minimum value is actually gonna be negative two for choice three. So that tells us choice four is out because choice three has a min value. So the min value here is negative two. So the goal is to now beat negative two. So now it's between these two answer choices. Now to explore the second answer choice, what we could do here, you can do this by just analysis, but I think it's easiest to use the calculator that we could copy the table into the L1, L2. So I'm writing zero through five and then the Y values are going here. And then what I could do is I could press stat. I'm gonna calculate. And since these are all quadratic functions, I'm gonna do a quadratic regression, which is option five. And then I'm just gonna keep pressing enter. And this is gonna give us the coefficients for A, B and C that our equation for choice two is gonna be y equals x squared minus five x plus six. So this is y equals x squared minus five x plus six. And now what we could do with this, we could just type this here. We have x squared minus five x plus six. And when we press zoom six to graph this, notice our vertex is here. And if I wanna find the minimum, I'm gonna press second trace number three is for minimum value and I'm gonna scroll nearby. I'm gonna press enter before the minimum, scroll to the right after the minimum, press enter a second time, third time, and the minimum is gonna be at negative 0.25. So the min here is gonna be at negative 0.25, which is once again occurring when X is 2.5. So that means we could eliminate this choice because the minimum for choice three was negative two. So now it's a battle between choice one and choice three. I would type choice one in the Y1 spots. We have six X squared, plus five X and then minus two. And when we press graph here, we could see this, but here I would just press second trace minimum. And let's hope we get something here less than negative two. So we scroll, we press enter before the minimum, enter after, enter a third time, and our minimum is gonna be at negative 3.04 and change. So we have Y equals negative 3.04 is our minimum, which is definitely less than negative two. So choice one wins. Question 21, we have to know how to evaluate a recursive sequence. So we have A1, that's our first term, and then a formula for the nth term. And anytime I see A sub N equals, and I see this piece here, the A sub N minus one term, I just think of as the term before, okay? The previous term. And recursive sequences are built by the previous stuff. So we're starting out with a sub one equals three. And now the second term, I would use the formula, is negative four plus, and notice this would be when n is equal to two. I would plug in a two here, and I would have a sub two minus one, which would give us a sub one. And then a sub one is equal to three, so I'd have negative four plus three, or negative four plus the term before, and that's gonna simplify to negative one. So now the third term, I would use the formula again, is negative four plus, and then what we have here, is the term before. And the term before we just found is negative one. Negative four plus negative one is negative five. And by now you might start to see the trend that the first term was three, then the second term, then the third term. This is gonna be an arithmetic sequence. We're decreasing by four each time. So if I go down four, I'm gonna get negative nine, negative 13, and this pattern will, con will continue. This is gonna match with choice two. Now I know it's not one because that doesn't match what we have here, but if I want to disqualify the other answer choices, let's say we were to plug in n equals two to this one, that would tell us our second term would be four times two minus one, which is seven, but that doesn't match negative one, so this is out. And if we plug in two here, we would have a sub two is four minus two, which is two. That also doesn't match this, so choice two is definitely our answer. For question 22, it helps to know that when you have factors, that the relationship between factors and roots is that they are opposite of each other. 
okay? So they are opposites of each other. So when I have the zeros of a function, so here are the roots. We have x equals 3. I'm sorry, x equals negative 3, x equals 0, and x equals 4. I think of the step before this, when we list these as factors, this one would be x plus 3, because if we set x plus 3 equal to 0, x would equal negative 3. And then this would come from, I could say x minus 0, but writing x minus 0 is unnecessary, because x minus 0 is just equal to x. So I could just write this piece as x. And then if I have a root of x equals 4, that would come from x minus 4, and I would be at this step here where everything is set equal to 0. But now if I'm naming this as a function g of x before I find the roots, I wouldn't be setting it equal to 0. This would just be equal to, I'll write the x first, and then it looks like the 3 term is next. So we have x plus 3, and then x minus 4. I would write the factors in this order to be able to match it to the answer choice. Remember, the order of the factors doesn't matter because multiplication is commutative, but this is matching up with choice three. Just know you could graph all of these functions too, and if you graph choice three, it's gonna hit the x-axis at negative three, zero, and four. Now question 23, we have Morgan read that a snail moves 72 feet per day, and he performs the calculation here to convert this rate to different units, and we wanna know what are the units for the converted rate. So when you convert from one unit to the other, you'll have to notice the cancellation of the units you start with. So notice here that when we multiply by one day over 24 hours, day over day cancels. And then when we multiply by one hour over 60 minutes, hours cancel out because those are matching units and they're on top and bottom. And then here we look and we could see that inches over feet, that feet and foot are matching units. That you know, foot and feet is just plural, but it's the same unit here. So those are going to cancel because we have one up top and one down bottom. And now think about what are we left with? We are left with, we have inches on top and we have minutes left on bottom. So the final units are going to be inches per minute. And this is going to match choice four. So the final question here, question 24, it's summer vacation. And Ben is selling hot dogs and pretzels on a food cart in Manhattan. And it costs Ben 50 cents for hot dogs and 40 cents for pretzels. And he only has $100 to spend. So for that first part, I look at the answer key for a hint. And yes, this we could say 50 cents times H would tell us how much money Ben spends on hot dogs, plus 40 cents or 0 0.40 times P, where P is the number of pretzels, would tell us how much money Ben spends on pretzels. But whatever the total amount Ben spends is, he only has $100 to spend, so that means his total bill has to be less than or equal to 100. Just think about it. If you were to go to a register and your bill, like you only have $100 in your pocket, whatever your bill is, like this is like your total bill, would have to be less than or equal to the money you have in your pocket. So right away I could see that choice three and choice four are out because it should say less than or equal to 100. But now the other crucial sentence, he wants to sell at least 200 items per day. So the items would be H plus P. And if he wants to sell at least 200, that means he wants to sell greater than or equal to 200 hot dogs plus pretzels per day. Okay, because at least means greater than or equal to. And right away I could see out of the remaining choices, this is gonna match up with choice two. This was like a little bit of a confusing question because they didn't actually want us to set up the system. They wanted us to have one correct component of the system and it's going to be choice two. 